Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for the second in our series of HYB webinars. Tonight, we're very pleased to be joined by James Marsden from Shropshire Farm Vets to give us tips on managing the transition period for the dairy cow. Please feel free to submit your questions throughout and then we'll answer either as we go along or at the end. Um, I will now pass over to James to start the webinar. Hi everyone, thanks for coming along and uh, inviting me to, to speak to you all. Okay, so uh, this evening we're talking about um, achieving a successful transition period. So uh, as Naomi said, if you've got any questions, um, just shout out or, or message the questions to Naomi so, so she can stop me. Um, yeah, when, when we're talking about the transition period, we're talking about the period from going into from the dry period um, into lactation. So um, I, I work at Shropshire Farm Vets uh, and we look after um, just under 25,000 dairy cows. Um, and most of my time is spent uh, with, with dairy farms, um, the vast majority of those with Holsteins, um, you know, looking at how we can improve the efficiency of, of milk production uh, and, and reproduction on, the, on those herds. So uh, what does good transition look like? Um, we'll consider uh, what we want to happen uh, during the transition period. Um, how do we know if the transition period is working for, you, for your farm? Um, and how do we get better? Um, ultimately, um, as, as time goes by, uh, things improve, uh, farms increase their milk output um, and, and attempt to reduce costs or relative costs as we go along. So um, we want more productive, healthy, happy cows. Um, and, and there's always a chance to improve on, on things, no matter how good we are. So um, good transition. Um, you, uh, everyone's probably got their own uh, take on it. But for me, it's a cow that calves uh, by herself uh, and then milks to her full potential. Uh, calving in with no milk fever. Um, no metritis, no ketosis, um, no LDAs. Um, it's a picture of a rule there doing his keyhole surgery. Um, you know, if, if a cow gets an LDA, you know that she's been ketotic. She might have had a problem uh, like metritis where she gets a uterine infection after calving and uh, she's really struggling. Uh, and obviously no, no mastitis as well. We don't want any, any other disease uh, coming from the dry period. Um, through into transition uh, and we want the cow to get back in calf on time which relies really heavily on good transition. So when we're thinking about um, any sort of process on a farm um, we, we think about um, a sort of management triangle if you like so it's just a sort of way of thinking about what we're doing so um, start start with um, uh, most, most of you will be, uh, be on, uh, on a farm at home uh, and you, you'll have uh, sort of management um, in place on the farm. You'll, you'll have your buildings, you'll have your feeding regime, uh, and, and you, you'll manage the cows through the transition period. Um, so we, we, can, we can measure that. We can measure how things are going uh, and then take stock uh, several times a year, monitor, monitor things, see how they're going and work out if we can improve. So um, we're looking to measure the performance of the transition. So uh, we, we look at sort of key performance indicators. So that's you know, a, bit of a, a bit of a long way of just saying we, we look at really important steps along the way through the transition period. Um, you know, does the cow carve by herself? Does she uh, get up without milk fever and walk in the parlour and let down loads of colostrum uh, first, first time around and, and, and make a seamless transition into lactation? Um, when we're recording things, we want it to be pretty painless to record. We don't want to have to be spending lots of time doing it. We don't want to have to spend a lot of time making the records or entering into the computer. So we want them to, to, be, to be easy. Um, and we want to be recording things that are most valuable to change. So um, you know, if, if we're recording um, cases of uh, uh, LDAs, um, we know that that's a sort of tip of the iceberg and there'll be lots of cows really struggling with their energy status um, for every one cow that has an LDA. So if we can make changes which help the energy status of those um, cows, we, we can make big valuable changes that help the rest of the cows going through transition. <clears throat> so in, in terms of success factors, what sort of things can we do to, um, to help cows succeed when they, when they go through the transition? Um, it starts off really before 
<clears throat> before they're even dried off. So um, the the body condition score at calving is going to have a really big impact on whether the cows get uh, ketosis, which is where they uh, they can't eat enough calories from the ration to support their energy requirements from lactation, um, which makes them many times more likely to have a, an LDA or twisted stomach um, and has a big negative impact on fertility. So other success factors will be um, relying on how much space there is per cow. Um, this drives uh, feed intake or dry matter intake uh, and allows them to drink more water and reduces the disease pressure during the transition period. So there's less chance of them getting mastitis from a, a dirty bedded area um, or, or less chance of them um, not getting up to eat because they're too crowded and, and not having enough calories to support their immune system. Uh, nutrition's a big, uh, big uh, success factor. So we want to be able to uh, control milk fever, uh, support colostrum quality, support the function of the rumen and the cow's immune system. So we'll, we'll, we'll tackle all those now. So, the, so for those of you who are not familiar with body condition scoring, um, AHDB Dairy's got a really good guide to doing it yourself. Um, but you, you can speak to your vet and get them to give you some training on it. Um, it's scored one to five. So one is a sort of skeleton thin cow. Um, five is a really fat <coughs> cow, which is, um, you know, there's rolls of fat on her. Uh, and, you know, most, most Holstein cows should be around two and a half, give or take, um, depending on where they are during the lactation. And the really important thing after calving is that they don't lose more than half a condition score because that's got really big, that sort of, it's a really big challenge for a cow. She's burning through that much body fat. She's going to um, struggle uh, in lactation. She's going to have a higher risk of ketosis, which is um, where she's got a negative energy balance. She's burning through the body fat. Um, it makes her feel sick and lethargic. Um, sometimes you see those cows licking the walls um, or, or just sort of staring into space. And they can be quite nervous or aggressive. Uh, and those cows are more likely to get a an LDA, twisted stomach, and have a lower conception rate in a longer time from calving to getting a calf again. So most, most cows will, will have a sort of genetic um, target for where, where they fall after, after they calve. Uh, they tend to produce a lot of milk and it takes some time, it takes a couple of weeks on average to start eating enough to support their energy requirement for producing milk. Uh, and during that time, they, they burn, burn some body fat and they they, um, they'll, they'll head down to a sort of target body condition. So the average from, so the, 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 the research is about 2.1 they'll drop to um, and uh, internationally. So I think mo most of our herds will see them a cow fall to between two and two and a half um, uh, after, after calving uh, when they reach peak lactation, peak yield uh, between 60 and 90 days. So that sort of tells us that we, don't want a cow calving much above two and three quarters if we can help it. So uh, some farms will have fat clubs, not fit clubs, but fat clubs, um, and they'll, they'll put the far off dry cows, as soon as they're dry off, onto straw for three or four weeks, um, just, just really reduce the energy content of the ration. So they, they, they get trim and get, get down to that sort of um, two and a half to three on body condition score. Um, by the time they come into the close-up group three weeks off calving. That's okay, um, but we're, uh, we're, we're better to manage it by stopping breeding cows from about 200 days in milk if they're not in calf, um, except the really high yielding cows, which are working hard. Um, and that, that way we avoid these sort of yo-yo cows where you'll have a cow calve in too fat, lose loads of weight, actually it's ketotic, she might get a DA. She goes, overshoots her sort of target, and gets very thin uh, and then takes a long time to get back in calf and hey presto she's she's producing not very much milk at the end of the next lactation so she's got fat again eating the milk eating the milk as ration and she's she starts the cycle again so we want to sort of break that cycle if we can um, to make transition easier and yeah uh, so we aim to aim to dry cows off and carve them in uh, when we're talking about a whole stone about two and three quarters um, Two and a half is okay, but if, if they have a bit of a hiccup along the way, they haven't got much in reserve. Um, three is okay, but they will be burning a, a bit more fat than, than 
is ideal. So space for cow, when we're thinking about the sheds, I mean, most people will have loose housing for dry, dry cows um, in the close-ups. Some will have it loose house all the way through and some people will have cubicles all the way through um, and just in time carving. Um, sp enough space for cows is really important because it drives the feed and water intake uh, and it reduces the disease pressure, you know, just the, just the muck in the bedding uh, and, and the, uh, the, the water in the bedding as well. So, you know, if, if, you're, if you're interested in, in the bedding space requirement, um, for every thousand litres of milk that a cow's giving, she needs one and a quarter square metres of bedding space, um, plus three metres squared on top of loafing space. So that's sort of exercise space. So this has just been a, uh, from survey data from HDB. So um, the more effectively, the more um, a cow eats, the more muck she produces. Uh, and this, this measure seems to be the sort of golden area where if you if you increase the space she's got above that you don't get much more benefit but you'll get the the absolute maximum benefit in terms of that amount of space which is it's a hell of a lot of space if you measure your sheds you'd be surprised how much cows need for if they're doing sort of um over eight thousand liters you know especially if you're getting towards sort of thirteen thousand fourteen thousand liters it's a, a lot of space they need in a, in a loose yard um feed barrier space wise cows will need about three feet in the in the transition period, so that's um, the sort of three three to six weeks um, either side of calving. You know, in, in the milkers, once they're past the fresh period, then then we we're happy with two foot or 60, 70 centimeters of cow, but they need a bit more space when they're heavily pregnant. And then in terms of feed barrier space, um, again, survey data from HDB is just showing that. Uh, we get a, an improvement in milk yield and reduction in disease uh, for cows as, as the space of the water trough increases up to about 10 centimetres per cow. So there's always fresh, clean water at any time for all cows. Um, and anything we can do to increase feed intake um, improves the disease status, um, helps cows produce more milk and reduces the time from calving to conception. So. Um, you should, though, especially dry cows, should always have feed in front of them. Um, you know, if you if you waste uh, waste a few percentage of key, of the of the feed, waste a few kilos of feed per cow, that's much better than saving a few that you should have better. Um, there should always be feed available for for transition cows by the side of calving. Uh, nutrition wise, um, there are several feed options, so rather we won't go into too much detail. Uh, you know, you've got decab, semi-decab, and restricted calcium diets. Um, but they all have common goals to avoid milk fever by getting the mineral balance correct, however you're planning to do it. Uh, last thing we want after calving is a cow unable to get up um, uh, milk fever. It sucks in a lot of time and effort, uh, and ultimately you've, you've invested a lot in that um, cow getting to calving and, um, and, and having a big, barrier of milk fever where she's a lot more likely to get mastitis, she's a lot more likely to um, have a twisted stomach afterwards and she's a lot more likely to leave the herd, that's the last thing we want. So um, the, the other big thing with nutrition in the close to calving period in trans transition is that it helps the cow produce enough good quality colostrum so that those, those uh, calves are going to get absolute top quality feed that's going to be full of antibodies to, to support their immunity in the first month of life. So I don't know if people have got these uh, refractometers, they're pretty cheap, you can get them for 20 or 30 pounds on Amazon. Um, you put a drop of milk on the end under the under the glass flap there uh, and then there's a, a, a sort of a scale there and you want that to be above 22 on the colostrum when you're measuring it at room temperature. Um, hold it up to the light and look through the eyepiece. Um, if you've got colostrum that's reading 22 or above, you know that um, three litres of that colostrum should have enough antibodies for the calf to, to survive well. And you know, if, you, if you're getting enough volume of good quality colostrum, you know that the feeding in terms of protein there is, is somewhere near right as well. Um, the other thing obviously with 
with nutrition in the in the transition period is to make sure the rumen's functioning really well so it's fired up ready to digest the milk and cow ration and uh, the cow's going to be able to really tuck into the milk and cow ration when she calves in uh, and get plenty of energy um, uh, and building blocks for, for lots of milk and also to support her immune function as well yeah uh, it's a big big immune challenge calving down there's a uh, uh, a, a lot of a lot of uh, you know 60 percent of the uh, sort of and antibiotic spend is on cows uh, within six weeks of calving. So um, making sure the immune system is firing all cylinders is really important. Um, so a question there, so uh, let's ask what's the best way of knowing if your nutrition is right uh, before something goes wrong. So um, if you, if you uh, take taking some colostrum samples every day, you know, uh, you, you need to do it before you feed the calf, but it's a really good indicator to show there may be a problem with the cows feeding if the volume of colostrum is not enough or the quality is not good enough. Um, you can you can take um, blood samples, I'll come on to it a little bit later, but uh, you can take blood samples in the close-up period um, in the week or 10 days before calving. Um, so you speak, if you speak to your vet and your nutritionist, get them, get them together on this. Um, you can look at things like uh, NIFAs and which is shows you if the, the body fat's been mobilized too quickly um, and you, you can look at um, your mineral balance there to make sure that they're not going to be at risk of milk fever so if you're if you're changing forages as you go along or you're seasonal calving and you, you just you've just got cows about to carve in the autumn now uh, and you want to make sure they're set up right you can take some blood samples before calving make sure that's going well uh, and at calving you can maybe take some blood samples for car for calcium to make sure they're not got subclinical milk fever so you can you if you've got cows that are just below normal but not down you can you can jump in early with some calcium and, and adjust the ration uh, and uh, in in the week or 10 days after calving you can take some bloods um, to check the ketones uh, which is a fat breakdown product uh, and they should be in a narrow narrow range uh, and and uh, you know your vet can help you interpret those and if if the if the ketones are too high you know that um something's going wrong uh, and, and you can investigate where it's happening you know why is the cow uh, not eating enough uh, calories to produce her milk is is she is the ration insufficient or is there not enough feed available um, or is it, or are the cows carving into fat? So you can kind of piece together a bit of a jigsaw there. Um, okay. So, yeah, so this is coming on sort of how we monitor. So um, when, when, you're, when you're thinking about the, how the transition period works in your farm, uh, you need to have a, a plan for fertility. You know, um, when are you going to start breeding your cows? When are you going to intervene to make sure they're served? By by specific time, um, you know we really really want as many cows as possible in calf before 120 days because typically the Holsteins that's when they start to to lose money over the year if they're not in calf for 120 days. So you want to start start serving in typically somewhere around 50 days in milk. Um, you want to have a plan for the housing. Make sure there's going to be enough space. Um, if everyone gets out there and measures their measures their dry cow sheds and um, and the uh, compares that to how much how much milk your cows are doing you'd be surprised to constantly moving target the, the sheds uh, sheds never big enough for very long um and uh, you know think about how, how are you going to manage groups of cows move, moving through the through the dry period into the transition period and close-up period and into into lactation and have a plan for feeding as well with the nutritionist um and uh, speak to your vet and your nutritionist together um so measure your milk fevers cases of milk fevers measure your colostrum how, mu how much is the, are the cows producing um what's the quality of it um count how many ldas you've got um your mastitis rate and your uterine disease or metritis rate and your fertility as well so you should be looking at your, your preg rate um you know how, how many cows that are eligible to become pregnant in a three-week period get pregnant so you should be you have actually be able to help you uh, find that on your farm software or, or help you help you figure out what that figure is. 
and just you know have, having a benchmark of those things and just just checking them uh, you know once a month or once a quarter depending on what's appropriate for your farm with your veterinary nutritionist is really important and uh, we can take these blood samples as we talked about just now um pre and post calving just to make sure that the nutrition's right especially if there's any changes um you know if you've got a change of silage clamp or silage cup or you've got a, a new maize going in um don't just assume it's going to feed as it says on the analysis just get a uh, get some bloods um three weeks after you've changed it and make sure those cows are responding as you expect um and if you can body condition score cows uh, the key times are at calving then at peak yield and then two three months before you dry the cows off um so sort of typically once a month and you can you can either do that yourselves or uh a lot of farm practices without have a vet tech now who can do that pretty quickly around milking time uh, it's just a, a useful and inexpensive tool to be able to to check that the uh treasure check the uh, feedings going right and the group changes are right uh, and make sure that cows are going to have a really good chance of transitioning well um if you if you've got robots you can probably get uh, cameras fitted on the on those as well to to measure the body condition to make it even easier um and yeah make make sure you have have meetings with your vet and your nutritionist together um at least a couple of times a year if you can uh, review your records together um and make any changes that you need to um it may may be changing the group sizes it may be choosing to stop breeding cows um at 200 days in milk uh, the ones that aren't really doing huge amounts of litres um, and just let them milk on uh, and, and choose your barons so that you're not um, carving really fat cows in which you're going to struggle during transition. Um, and if, you, you know, if you're getting milk fevers, you review that and ha have a look at what the bloods are telling you uh, at carving um, and, and your nutritionist can make changes to the to the mineral that's going in the in the feed there. And, uh, and uh, then your vet can repeat the bloods and, and check that you you've got rid of the subclinical milk fever and you'll find find the cows uh, produce more milk and um, have less less disease problems and get getting calf sooner. So um, yeah, any, any questions? That's it. And a bit of a whistle stop tour. It's a bit different giving a giving a presentation through the computer without people in front of you waving at you or or nodding along. So um, yeah, if anyone's got any questions, fire away. Fire away now. Okay, so I've got a question from Mark there. Um, how good are kexstone boluses for fatties? Um, so obviously that's a, a prescription medicine. So you'd have to get your vet to identify cows at risk of ketosis on your farm. And yeah, uh, cows that are fat, so cows that are more than half a condition score higher than your peak yielding cows. Um, to have a really good response uh, with with Kirkstone. so those cows are at high risk of ketosis, uh, and typically we we find that um, we find uh, I don't know if a lot of, a lot of you know um, Rob Higgins. He he um, we had a we had a farm walk there, and he, he presented his data a couple of years ago, and he he found that those fat cows that were given Kirkstones were giving about five hundred liters more milk. So um, and you know. And, and got in calf a fortnight sooner than than the average so that was a you know some of our genuine farm data we could see it makes a big difference um but yeah speak to your vet about that as a prescription medicine um from sue cope if the colostrum a cow produces isn't good enough uh will this be the case uh for it with future calves uh and what off the shelf colostrum is best to look for so uh you're right some some cows will be um genetically better at producing a larger volume of quality colostrum than others um but nutrition will have a really big impact so um if, if you've got one cow out of a whole group that's the poor one then yeah that cow's probably genetically not so good at producing good quality colostrum or she may have another problem like she may be too fit or she may be lame um but if if uh, if everything else is set up well, um, and and you've got a group that are struggling, then you, you just need to probably uh, speak to the vet and a nutritionist and just tweak the ration, maybe increasing the 
the metabolized protein there will, will help to improve the colostrum quality. Um, uh, and off the off the shelf colostrums, there's several available. Um, you know, the SCR ones um, got some good data behind it. Um, there's an XR vets colostrum which got good data behind it. Um, best best to speak to your vet. You know, present the options. Which you know, if you if you're shopping around, present those several options to your vet and just um, discuss them together. And just make sure you can you can um, take some bloods from cars after they've had the colostrum just to check that they've within a week after they've had it to make sure that they've they've got good uh, passive transfer of immunity to make sure that they've absorbed it. So that's that's um that's good but if you if your cow's not producing good quality colostrum she's probably not getting enough good quality nutrition um or or she's got a problem herself and the ability of the calf born to that cow is not going to be quite as good to absorb the colostrum either so you definitely need to look into that um question from amy uh what would be your top tips for heifer selection if you mean Selecting heifers to breed from, then you know genomic testing is a great way to do it. I'm a big fan of Clarified and Clarified Plus. Uh, they've got the dairy wellness traits in there now, so you can choose the heifers that are going to be most profitable and have the least disease for your herd. The ones that are going to need the least antibiotics and the least intervention after calving. But otherwise, you want heifers which grow really well. There's youngsters which come bulling at the right age, um, have really good confirmation. Um, and then obviously heifers that are giving a, over a kilo of milk by 30, uh, over, over a kilo of protein in the milk in the, at day 30 of lactation. So I hope that answers your question, Amy. If you want to add to it, feel free. There's a question coming here from Michael, which is how should the management change for in-calf heifers coming into the herd, given they represent 20% of the herd? So um, that's a really good question. There's uh, a lot of answers um, to that. So there's no, no sort of no sort of strictly right answer to that. Um, the, the later you integrate the heifers with the cows, the, the lower your risk of, of mastitis, um, but the higher your risk of bullying or, 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 or problems um, with, with dominant cows stopping the meeting. So if, if, you, if you do it, you want to be doing that at least three weeks <clears throat> before calving so that they've got a chance to settle down uh, in the social group and, and, and make sure that they're, they're really eating well and, and settled in that last three weeks before calving. Um, heifers need a bit more um, protein than cows because they're still growing. So <clears throat> some, some people will have a separate group if they've got a, if, you know, if you've got a, a, a large herd um, and you can have a, a, a big group of heifers then you, you could maybe feed them separately. Um, most herds, that's not really practical. So you, you choose a sort of halfway house on your metabolized for protein between 1200 and 1400 grams, um, which is the, the optimum for a cow at 1200 and optimum for a heifer at 1400 grams. The question from Sue Cope, in your opinion, is genomic testing expensive or cheap? That's a, again, a good question. Uh, the answer is probably that it's both. First up, when you pay for it, uh, it makes it expensive. Um, but it's going to be between uh, 20 and 45 pounds, depending on, on which you're using. Um, the dairy wellness traits that you can get with the more expensive clarified tests, I think are well worth it. Um, if, you, if you're choosing um, heifers from the, the top uh, quartile of your, of your range, those are going to probably pay you back um, 1,500 to 2,000 pounds over the lifetime. Um, and if you choose to breed from those uh, those top ones and not the bottom ones, you'll gradually cement that genetic potential into the herd. So over the long term, it's very cheap. Uh, in the short term, yeah, cash flow wise, it's it is expensive, but I think it's it's worth worthwhile doing. And once you've once you've started, um, you know, you can you can get into it, and the return is 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 very is very good in the long term. But it's takes it takes a year or two to start getting the return that's for sure whilst we're also talking about transition there's quite a few of the wellness traits focus on transition so um the risk of metritis and the risk of retained cleansings have you got the data to back up lifetime return with genomics not to hand 
if you go on the Clarify website, there's some really good uh, documents there. Or if you speak to your vet, they should be able to put you in, put you in touch with with a relevant person from Zoetis. There's a there's a lot of a lot of data uh, that does back that up, um, not just from the US but from the UK as well. So if there's no more questions, um, I'd like to thank you, James, for giving up your evening to, tonight to speak to us. I hope we've, everyone's found it interesting. I'm sure we've all taken away a few valuable pointers. It's been great insight on the transition. Um, thank you, everyone else, for joining us and also for the great questions you've asked. Um, I hope you'll join us next time with Lightning Ridge Genetics, which will be the September edition of the webinar series. Um, but thank you very much, everyone, for joining us, and James in particular, for giving up your evening. Pleasure. Okay, thanks very much, everybody. Great. Thank you ever so much. Cool. Cheers. Bye. -bye.